He is the most famous person on the planet and the most divisive. Equally loved and equally abhorred, it is impossible not to have an opinion about the brash, Twitter-loving 45th President of the United States. Yet few people truly understand what makes Trump, Trump. By going back into his past, we are able to gain valuable insight into the vast complexities that make up the man. In this week's biographics, we're looking at the Donald before he took up residence at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Donald John Trump was born on June 14, 1946, the fourth of five children to Fred Trump and Mary McLeod. Donald's grandfather, also nicknamed Frederick, migrated in 1885 from Germany. He brought with him a reputation as one of the finest builders of his generation. Frederick helped to change the face of Queens with his building projects. They primarily consisted of the construction of solid, though basic, brick rental apartments. Fred followed his father's path and became a prominent residential developer. By the time Donald was in his teen years, his father had amassed more than 27,000 apartments in such Brooklyn suburbs as Flatbush, Sheepshead Bay, Bensonhurst and Brighton Beach. He also had extensive properties in the Queen's neighborhoods of Coney Island and Jamaica Estates. In addition to his residential housing portfolio, Fred moved into commercial development. During the Depression years of the 30s, he built Trump Market, which was a supermarket built on the concept of serve yourself and save. With war on the horizon, he also got into construction on military bases. Donald's mother, Mary McLeod Trump, was of Scottish heritage. She met Frank in the early 1930s as a teenager. When they were married in 1936, she was just 24 years old. They settled into a 23-room house in Queens. The house was extravagant, with a colonial-style portico frame entrance and six imposing white marble pillars. Fred's two Cadillacs, FCT1 and FCT2, were parked in the driveway. The Trumps were one of the few families to have an intercom system installed in their home, not to mention a chauffeur and a personal butler. Mrs. Trump was also a philanthropist who became passionately involved in a number of causes that were close to her heart. She was the main driving force of the Ladies Helper of Jamaica facility, as well as the Jamaica Daycare Nursery. Mary was also an ardent supporter of the National Kidney Establishment of New York and the group mainstreaming partners of Incredible Neck New York, which provided help for people who were crippled. Of all of his children, young Donald showed the most interest in his father's business ventures. As a result, Fred would sometimes take the boy onto construction sites with him. As he developed his own personality, Donald gained a bit of a reputation as a bully. His parents were lax in imposing discipline upon him. On one occasion, the Trump's neighbor, Martha Burnham, came home to find the four-year-old Donald throwing stones at her son, Dennis. Donald had apparently targeted Dennis as an easy mark for his venom. Martha warned her son to stay away from the nasty Trump boy. By the time he was eight, Donald was the leader of a group of young thugs who would ride around Queens on their bicycles, yelling out insults to people and stopping to deal with other youngsters who they didn't like the look of. He was known for saying whatever he wanted and acting impulsively. Fred enrolled Donald at a private education facility in Forest Hills called Q Forest School. Fred happened to be on the board of trustees for that school. This fact seems to have emboldened Donald in his wayward behaviors. Taking the lead amongst a bunch of boys who were constant troublemakers, he would pull girls' hair, purposely bump into other students' desks, and talk out of turn in class. Donald's grades, they were mediocre at best. This was mainly due, though, to lack of application rather than lack of ability, a situation that greatly frustrated his teachers. However, on the playgrounds and the sports field, he displayed considerable ability. His favorite gym game was dodgeball. He displayed great dexterity in avoiding balls that were thrown at him, and he was often the last man standing. Outdoors, he excelled at baseball. He was a talented player and a fierce competitor. As a sixth grader, his batting power was exceptional. When he came up to bat, the defending side would have to extend its fielders way out in order to handle his daunting right arm swing. One morning, when he was 12 years old, Donald and his friend Peter Brandt jumped on the train to Manhattan. Such an excursion had not been authorized by Donald's parents. Getting off at Fifth Avenue and 53rd, they spent the day strolling through Central Park, buying curiosities at novelty stores and wandering among the homeless. One of the items that Donald purchased was a switchblade knife. It was months later that Fred discovered the knife, and the story of Donald's unauthorized trip to the city was uncovered. Fred, he was outraged. He finally came to the realization that Donald was out of control and that something had to be done. 
Fred decided that his fourth son was in dire need of some external discipline. He enrolled Donald at the Rosier Military Boarding School about 70 miles away. There would be no more comfortable living in the mansion and swanning around the neighborhood for Donald. In implementing this new strategy, Fred acted quickly, not even giving his son time to say his farewells. Life was indeed vastly different at the military school. The boys were required to wear a uniform that consisted of a thick fleece pullover and pants. An alarm woke them up early in the morning and their entire day was regulated by the clock. Donald's life was now completely controlled by Theodore de Bias, the hands-on school administrator. De Bias was a no-nonsense World War II veteran who demanded excellence from his new recruits. He knew that many of the boys that were sent to him were there to be toughened up and to have discipline imposed upon them. And he took that responsibility very seriously. As you might imagine, all of this was a pretty serious shock for Donald. His initial reaction was resentment and a natural tendency to buck the system. He soon racked up a number of charges, including not making his bed and not properly cleaning the sink. Yet, Administrator Tobias saw something else in the young Trump. The boy was incredibly driven and always had a desire to be number one. Realizing that bucking the system was only going to get him in deeper trouble, Donald began trying to follow the rules. The biggest improvement was with regard to his personal orderliness. He won awards for the cleanliness of his personal area. Indeed, his orderliness bordered on the obsessive, winning him the nickname Mr. Fastidious. Donald's loudmouth bluster quietened down as discipline was injected into his system. He became soft-spoken and had an air of self-confidence. He developed friendships, despite often being regarded as a bit cocky and bragging too much about his father's wealth. Then, during his senior year, Donald was made a company captain. This put him in a position of oversight over younger boys. He inspected their personal space and was responsible for generally keeping them in order. His reputation was such that he very rarely had to raise his voice at his charges. A simple stare, sometimes a accompanied by a raised eyebrow, was enough to impart his displeasure. In his position as company captain, Trump proved himself to be an effective delegator. This developed to the extent that he would give the job of inspection of the boys under his command to others, while he retired to his room to recline on his bed. This practice soon came to the attention of Administrator Tobias, who was less than impressed. He removed Trump from his role as company captain and gave him a school administrative position instead. Donald then went on to frame this as a promotion for his stellar job in his previous role. So, following his graduation from Rosier at the age of 18, he enrolled at Fordham University in the Bronx to study real estate. He was determined to follow in his father's footsteps and enter the world of real estate development. Of course, he was going to do it bigger and better than his old man, and to do that, he figured he needed a real estate degree. In 1966, after two years at Fordham, Donald transferred to the University of Wharton Business College. Here, he was out of place. While coming from a background of money, he didn't have the Ivy League breeding of those he rubbed shoulders with. He was rough and obtuse and soon proved himself to be the proverbial round hole in a landscape of square pegs. On his first day, the lecturer asked why every student there had decided to study real estate. When it came to his turn, Donald stood up and declared that he was going to become the king of New York City when it came to the real estate business. Trump graduated from Wharton in 1968, returning to New York with a degree in real estate. At this time, he was eligible for the draft to serve his country in Vietnam. However, a September 1968 physical exam resulted in a medical suspension due to bone goads in his heels. Setting himself up in an apartment in Queens, Trump began working for his father in early 1969. From the very start, he felt a deep-seated need to prove to his father that he was a supremely talented real estate man. The Trump way of doing business was called into question in 1973 when a handful of tenants took up a class-action lawsuit against the company claiming racial discrimination in violation of the Fair Housing Act. The case was impossible to prove, however, and the Trump Organization paid a small settlement without any admission of guilt. Around this same time, Donald was promoted to president of the company, and his first act was to rename the company. The former Elizabeth Trump and son became the Trump Organization. One of his next moves was to hire aggressive attorney Roy Cohn. Cohn had a reputation as a bulldog lawyer. If anyone dared to file a suit against those who he worked for, he would go out and destroy them. 
In 1975, Donald met Ivana Maria Zelnichkova. She was a beautiful sports skier who hailed from Czechoslovakia. A romance soon blossomed, and after a two-year courtship, the couple were married. Over the next five years, Ivana was given management responsibility in a number of business ventures. She also bore Trump three children, Donald Jr., Ivanka, and Eric. The vast majority of Fred Trump's business was centered on middle-income housing in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. To Donald, this was small time. He wanted to break into the large-scale commercial real estate in the heart of the Big Apple. He set his sights on a project in Manhattan. His target was the Commodore Hotel. The Commodore was a derelict 2,000-room white elephant on 42nd Street. Trump intended to completely remodel it into an upmarket Hyatt Hotel. The Hyatt Empire was run by the Pritzker family. Despite having presences all over the states, they had no representation in New York. But the area surrounding the Commodore was extremely seedy, and the Pritzkers were in need of some serious convincing. For Donald, however, the seedy environment and the decrepit state of the hotel meant that he would be able to pick up the property at a steal of a price. To make the purchase, however, he would need to borrow a lot of money. The finance was secured by bank loans that were underwritten by both Fred Trump and the Hyatt organization. Donald also managed to secure a 40-year tax exemption on the building. The renovation of the Commodore and its metamorphosis into the Grand Hyatt Hotel proved to be a great success, with Trump winning accolades from the city fathers, along with an award for the tasteful and creative recycling of a distinguished hotel. The Grand Hyatt project, coupled with the reflected reputation of his father, established Donald as a legitimate player in the New York commercial real estate market. Shortly after the completion of the Hyatt project, Trump began negotiations to develop a 58-story building on Fifth Avenue adjacent to famous New York landmark Tiffany & Company. This $200 million development was to be Trump's masterpiece. It would feature a six-story atrium that was lined with pink marble and an 80-foot waterfall. The penthouse was to be Donald's personal living quarters, with his offices just below. The first couple of floors would then feature some of the world's most famous retailers. The building opened in 1983 and was named Trump Tower. Its opening received international attention and was attended by a number of celebrities. At the same time that Donald was working on Trump Tower, a local New York builder was attempting to repair derelict Wallman skate rink. After two and a half months, the work had stalemated. There was a lot of public dissatisfaction that the rink was not reopened on time. Then Donald interjected himself into the whole affair when he wrote a letter to the mayor stating that he could supercharge the project and bring it in well under budget. The mayor responded by calling his bluff. Donald went straight to a concreter that he had a working relationship with. He convinced them to take the Woolman Rink project on for free, with the guarantee that the publicity it would bring would far outweigh the costs involved. The project went ahead on that basis and was completed under time and under budget by three quarters of a million dollars. The publicity and public appreciation that the Woolman Rink project brought in was huge, but it was all directed toward Donald Trump. The contractor who had done the heavy work without payment barely even got a mention. The early 1980s saw Trump moving into the gambling business. He acquired all of the necessary licenses and then purchased a property in Atlantic City. To do this project, he partnered with the Holiday Inn Corporation, the parent company of Haraz Casinos. In 1984, the facility opened as Haraz at Trump Plaza. The casino was a great success, whetting Trump's appetite for more. He actively sought out casinos that had failed gambling licenses. Finding one in the form of the Atlantic City Hilton Hotels Casino, he acquired the property, spending $310 million on the purchase and upgrade. It later reopened as Trump Castle. Always wanting to go one better, Trump took over development of the largest casino in the world at the time, the Taj Mahal. The Trump Taj Mahal opened in 1990. However, Trump had to go into extreme debt in order to open the doors. Revenues would have to average a million dollars per day in order to cover costs. This was simply an unheard of number, and the reality was that it was never going to happen. Trump indeed had to go through major bankruptcy restructuring in order to keep the casino going, eventually ending up with just a 10% ownership stake. Around this same time, Trump also established Trump's Hotels and Casino Resorts, which became a publicly traded company. 
Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Trump never let up on his real estate developments, despite his financial problems. In 1985, he purchased 76 acres of western Manhattan in order to create a television city complex. Then, in 1988, he purchased the Plaza Hotel for $407 million. Then, 1989 saw his first investment in Florida. By this time, he had also acquired a number of golf resorts across the country. In 1992, Trump hit the headlines for all the wrong reasons, when his affair with a 23-year-old actress named Marla Maples was exposed. Despite rumors, Ivana refused to believe the truth until Marla followed the Trumps on a skiing trip and confronted Ivana with the news that Donald was in love with her and that Ivana best give up on him. This was too much for Ivana. She filed for divorce, leaving Maples free to marry Donald, which she did in 1993. They had one child together, who they named Tiffany, after the famous New York department store. The marriage, though, it was rocky from the start and ended in divorce in 1999. Ironically, the proceedings were instigated by Donald when he learned that his wife was having an affair. Donald was then associated with a number of women in the early 2000s. Back in 1998, he had met a Slovenian beauty by the name of Melania Knaus. Over the next few years, their relationship developed to the point where Melania became Donald's constant companion. They were engaged in 2004 and married on January 22, 2005 in Palm Beach, Florida. The couple's only child, Baron William Trump, was born on March 20, 2006. On October 21, Trump Hotels, Casinos and Resorts restructured its debt, resulting in Trump's ownership of the company dropping from 59 to 27%. The company applied for bankruptcy. It re-emerged as Trump Entertainment Resort Holdings. Trump now put a premium on pushing his brand, with the Trump logo being placed on all manner of products. He even released his own game, Donald Trump's Real Estate Tycoon. Trump's political views they have undergone a metamorphosis over the years. Up until 1987, he was a Democrat. However, in that year, he registered for the first time as a Republican. Toying with the idea of running for office, he placed full-page ads in three papers espousing his views, which were that America needed to stop propping up other countries and start looking after its own people. In October of 1999, Trump established an exploratory panel to assess the viability of his running for the Reform Party's candidate for presidential nominee in 2000. It was decided that his lack of profile on the West Coast would be too much of a detriment. This led him to pass on the opportunity. From that point onwards, however, he bided his time and increasingly made political comment for public consumption. In 2003, Trump ventured into the world of reality television when he became the executive producer and star of The Apprentice. The show, in which contenders go through a series of challenges to win a job as Trump's apprentice, was a huge success. It propelled Donald Trump to worldwide recognition status and won him a star on Hollywood's Walk of Fame. Trump re-entered the political arena in 2001 when he raised questions about the legitimacy of President Barack Obama's birth certificate. He doggedly held to this view, despite Obama's insistence that he was born on U.S. soil. He seriously considered running for the top office again in 2012, but again decided that the time wasn't right. Then, on June 16, 2015, he famously announced from Trump Plaza that he would be throwing his hat into the ring for the Republican nomination for president in 2016. Few people took him seriously, but serious he was, and history will record him, for better or worse, as the 45th president of the United States. So I really hope you enjoyed that episode of Biographics. If you did, there's a couple of things you could do right now. One is hit that like button below. Also, if you want more stuff like this, we put out brand new videos every Monday and every Thursday. So hit that subscribe button below. And subscribe button doesn't do what it used to on YouTube. If you actually want to get a notification about these videos, please do hit that bell button next to the subscribe button. And that'll send you a notification every time, every Monday and Thursday when we put out a new video. Also, if you want to watch something else right now, stuff from the archive, over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.